Welcome to the Daily Horror Habit Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Krieger, bringing you daily reviews of currently streaming horror movies for your twisted pleasure. Be aware that these reviews may include mild spoilers. And as always, I hope you enjoy. After Final Destination 3's sensational return to form for the series, it's time to review the final Destination film. Well, not really. The fourth iteration of the series is in fact titled The Final Destination, yet we would see another sequel just two years later. Titling sequels as the final film in a franchise is a trend within horror that always bums me out. While these franchises are always revived at some point, it unfortunately shows a lack of studio confidence in a franchise by trying to put a definitive end on something that will always have the potential for new and exciting stories. Though perhaps the quality of the final destination speaks to it being time to wrap this series up. Released in 2010, David R. Ellis, the director behind Final Destination 2, returns to direct the 3D-focused fourth iteration in the franchise. I was bummed to learn that James Wong was on board to direct originally, but because of scheduling conflicts with Dragon Ball Evolution, he decided to drop out. Which, I think we all know was definitely the wrong call. The Final Destination focuses on a new crop of teens that find themselves in death's crosshairs, after Nick O'Bannon has a premonition of his friends and him dying in a freak race car accident. Though surviving the crash is just the beginning as death begins picking off the survivors one by one in increasingly gory ways. Right from the start, the film being shot in 3D is a pretty strong example of why the fad of shooting in 3D needs to end. As you can only watch it in 2D on video on demand, the 3D element is lost, but also the film has this cheap look to it and is filled with awkward angles and depth of field shots that would only look right in 3D. Not very forward thinking on Ellis's part. From a marketing angle, I suppose this was the way to sell fans on a fourth iteration, but in terms of longevity, age has not been kind to the look of the final destination. From the opening moments, it's clear this will be the weakest narrative of the series so far, and that the crop of protagonists lack any of the charisma or emotional investment of Alex or Wendy from past films. Nick and his girlfriend lead the charge in attempting to warn those who survived the racetrack disaster that they're in danger, but they are always one step behind death's design. I get that these films largely have a formula. I'm not mad at it. It sets up nicely for the kills, but after four films it feels even more tiresome given the lack of compelling characters or narrative risks. It's the fourth film in a franchise. Take some risks, why don't you? In an interview with Bobby Campo, who plays Nick, he said, We trimmed down the exposition and got right to what the people want. Now, I don't believe this was his intention, but I think this type of approach dismisses what horror fans actually want in a film and plays into the stereotype that fans are rabid gorehounds, turning their noses up at anything that gets in the way of that. This approach speaks to my issues with the film, in that while these movies were never heavily reliant on a gripping narrative, the complete absence of anything other than a bare-bones approach makes for an underwhelming experience, let alone not a fitting end to a supposed final chapter in a series. But let's get into ranking the main character kills, rather than me ranting and raving about the film's overall forgettable characters and painfully bad dialogue. And also no explanation for the premonitions. Oh, and also no Tony Todd in this one. See, there I go complaining. Moving on. First up, and it's not even technically a kill, but the film's opening credit sequence is a fantastic montage of x-rays replaying various deaths from the past three films. This is a stellar sequence that not only acknowledges the prior films, but is a great example of the timeless creativity of those kills displayed with some pretty great graphics and a fun rock soundtrack. Definitely the best title sequence of the series. So at number one is going to be the McKinley Speedway premonition. This is the opening scene that the film has, and it's certainly a bold decision on Ellis's part to start a film with another car-related mass casualty disaster. I say another, given that he directed Final Destination 2, and the best segment of that film was its opening highway pileup. I was hoping that this would work in his favor, but it sorely does not. Despite this being a large set-piece kill, it's heavily marred by some fairly atrocious CGI. Sure, CGI has been used throughout the film's history, but never this egregiously noticeable before. It's incredibly underwhelming for sure, but there are some bloody splatters that stand out amongst the film's other less-than-stellar kills, which are pretty extensive. Some quick facts about the Speedway disaster. It's based on the real-life Lehman's Speedway disaster that killed 84 people, after cars crashed and launched into the stands. In the film, the racetrack is called McKinley Speedway, which was the name of the high school from Final Destination 3. And Nick and his friends are sitting in section 180 of the stands, 180 being the flight number of the original Final Destination flight that crashed. Next up is Samantha's salon trip. This entire sequence is better constructed than the raceway scene, yet it lacks the payoff to be number one. This lengthy trip is a nerve-wracking set piece filled with fake-outs and domino effect occurrences that truly make it impossible to guess where the kill is going to come from. There's faulty wiring, compressed air cans, exploding scissors near her face, and barber chair that slams down suddenly. 
It's a litany of deadly possibilities and is quite tense. And then all of this is undone with her being killed by a rock that a lawnmower runs over that's flung at the speed of light and pierces her eye, killing her. Sure, it's super dark that the rock that kills her is the same one that her sons were throwing at a street sign earlier in the scene. But I feel like there were so many more brutal and creative alternatives inside the actual salon. Up next, Carter's the -the over-the-top, aggro, racist, fire death clocks in at number three. After getting shithouse drunk, Carter drives to George, the security guard who stopped him from rushing into the fiery racetrack rubble to find his wife, his house, to plant a burning cross in his yard. He also calls George the N-word in a prior scene, and has Nazi tattoos, just in case you didn't know he was racist. This is a kill that is mostly designed with an ironic laugh in mind, as Carter gets locked out of his truck, gets his leg tangled in a chain, and is subsequently dragged down the street and catches on fire from a gas leak sparked by, well, sparks from the chains rubbing against the asphalt. Eventually, the truck explodes and Carter's head lands right in George's yard. It's super silly and is over fairly quickly, but I liked it because, well, fuck racists. Pretty simple stuff. Next is Andy's cross-diced auto-body kill. This is another super brief and blatant example of awkward 3D not translating to 2D. And a brief domino triggering of effects, an acetylene tank is flung into his chest, sending him flying into a metal chain-link fence, where he's cross-diced with chunks of his body falling through the fence like meat. I didn't care for this kill, but it's being listed at number 4 tells you all you need to know about the next few kills. Such as Hunt's death being yet another blatant example of a death orchestrated for laughs, rather than utilizing a space creatively. Basically, after diving into a community pool to recover his lucky coin, Hunt gets his ass stuck to the vent on the pool floor and gets his inside sucked out. Admittedly, it's kind of funny, but comes off as feeling cheap compared to even Andy's kill. This entire segment is awkwardly shot as well, given it's cut between Janet almost dying at a car wash and Hunt getting laid and later being menaced by a kid with a squirt gun. The pacing is not only super slow and the scene drags, but using the lucky coin as a device to get Hunt to dive into the pool isn't backed up by anything, considering he only mentions it once before in the first 15 minutes of the film. The whole thing feels sloppy and uninspired, even compared to the other underwhelming kills in the film. Second to last has to be Lori, Janet, and Nick's death at the end. Taking a page out of Wong's playbook, Ellis realized that with this being the supposed end chapter in the series, they'd have to kill off the characters who think they survived Death's design. Of course, there is no escaping death, and during their second trip to the Death by Caffeine coffee shop, a Mack truck drives through the storefront, killing the three of them. Unlike the similar fate of Final Destination 3's characters, it's not only obvious they are going to die in the Final Destination, but it's also overly simplistic. A cheap ending for a film that can't be described as anything but. I didn't feel or care for their deaths because the film spends zero time in attempting to invest us in them in a meaningful way. But my least favorite kill goes to George's death, where Ellis blatantly rips off Wong's sudden bus kill in the original Final Destination. George steps off a sidewalk without looking and gets hit by an ambulance. That's it. That's the kill. Zero creativity stops this from being a homage, and rather a blatant example of copy and pasting something with the hopes of working, but it certainly does not. I tried to go into the Final Destination with an open mind. Truly, I did. After the stellar Final Destination 3, I had high hopes for the Final Destination, and yet it manages to be the most underwhelming film in the series so far. Completely forgettable characters, lackluster kills, and a cheap production value makes this not only a bad Final Destination film, but a bad film in general. I'm hopeful that maybe Final Destination 5 learns from the shortcomings of the previous film, and gives the people what they really want. More Tony Todd, obviously. And that'll do it for another edition of Daily Horror Habit. I'll see you guys soon for another horror movie review. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Daily Horror Habit podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to Daily Horror Habit on your preferred streaming service. And follow at Daily Horror Habit on Instagram or at Daily Horror Pod on Twitter.